Hey, everybody. Welcome to Perpetual Motion, a podcast focused on culture, communication, wellness, and relationships. I'm the host, Dr. Mo Anderson, and my goal is to help you stress less, produce more, and love the ones you're with. This episode, my special guest is Kelly Calabrese, a divorce recovery expert, wellness coach, speaker, best-selling author, and business owner. She has been featured in Forbes, the New York Times, HuffPost, and numerous other major media outlets. With three, three science degrees and 27 certifications, I'm not kidding, she is an expert on numerous wellness topics. However, after her own painful divorce, she became certified as a divorce coach to get healed, to get healed herself and help others do the same. I cannot wait to hear those lessons learned. You can't say Dr. Mo ain't tell ya that fear magnifies the consequences of failure. What are you scared of? Why are you afraid? I'd rather live like I'm dying than live to die any day. My heart is pure and my soul is safe. All right. Welcome to Perpetual Motion with Dr. Mo Anderson, Kelly. Oh, thank you so much um, for having me. I'm, I'm just happy to be here. I'm excited. I'm excited. You've got a, a broad range of knowledge, all of your certifications and degrees. And I'm looking forward to you bringing us some tips and strategies because we know divorce rates are rising and there are a lot of people dealing with divorce and separation who I think you can help. But I'm first excited to dive into your mission to help women going through separation and divorce. To start from the beginning, tell me about your own experience with divorce. Absolutely. Well, I thought I had it all together. (laughs) I can laugh at that now. You know, I was married for 25 years. I was at the top of my industry, had two teenagers in college who were thriving athletically, academically, great friends, you know, world-class trips, living in a mansion. You know, it was just all, I thought, going well. Right. And then my husband of 25 years came home and said, my commitment to our marriage is zero. And he left (laughs) Mm -hmm. and it floored me. I mean, that was really the turning point for me. That wasn't that things had not happened to me in life prior to that moment, but that was my thing. And it really took me to my knees and emptied me out and made me question a lot of things. You know, who am I? How did this happen to me? How do I make this pain stop and never come back again? And how do I navigate my kids through this? And so I went on a three year, what I lovingly call a healing sabbatical determined to figure this out. You know, how do you make the pain stop and how do you rebuild yourself? And so I I did, I went on a journey and came out on the other side. I'm I'm happy for you. I have been on that uh, journey. I was married for 17 years and my kids were teen when I teens when I got divorced, 14 and 16. They're adults in their 30s now, but you are right. It it has a devastating impact on you and on your family members and it is a journey to get to get through so three years what helped you personally at that time you weren't an export expert in this area what what helped you personally overcome the feelings of of pain fear and uncertainty well i did all the things (laughs) i went to divorce recovery i was in prayer groups I was in Bible studies. I went on retreats, conferences, read the books, listened to the the TED Talks and journaled and it just really did everything that I could. I was in counseling. I took all the profile tests. I mean, I really wanted to figure this thing out. And I nailed it down to eight things that really made a significant, palpable difference for me And I believe it's universal and it could be applied not only to divorce, but really to any grief, any struggle, any hardness in your life. Oh, I I, I can see that. I think you're right, because it's a loss. Loss is a loss, loss of a job, loss of a significant other. If if it's something that was important to you, it's it's really, really hard to go through that. Um, So you you went on your journey, you went through the courses, and you know what, I applaud you too, because a lot of times we kind of get caught up in just the bitterness and what the other person 
could have done better and we can just stew there for a long time so that you spent three years you know, in personal development and introspection is, is really, really amazing. I mean, I've had a lot of friends get divorced. We've all seen it. And, and that's not always the option that people take. Oh, I was bitter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for that transparency. Bitter. Yeah, no, I went through every single feeling. I mean, the shock, the denial, the anger, the sadness, the depression, the bitterness, the, you know, I went through all of it. And it's not like this linear, like next step, next step. It is messy. You're jumping around. You're getting triggered. You think you're good. And then all of a sudden, you know, you see their picture on social media with some woman and then it, you know, throws you back again. And you, then you think you're good. And then they do something with the kids and you're like, oh my goodness. And, you know, then in a moment they're re-engaged and you're like, what the heck? And that throws you back. And so I went through it all. I just didn't get stuck or stopped there. Right. Not stuck or stopped. I like that. I like that. So many, many women and men have gone through a divorce and learned things from it. I mean, whether they wanted to or not, their lessons learned. And they, you know, we pass on advice to personal friends who come to you because all of a sudden you're the expert in your circle on divorce, as so they think. But you became a certified divorce coach. What does a divorce coach do? I honestly, I'd never heard of that. When I saw that is <laughs> is one of your titles and your skill set, I was like, really? This is a thing? It is a thing. You know, originally I did it again selfishly <laughs> for myself because I am a knowledge person and knowledge helps me heal. And when I understand, I'm like, oh. And I learned so much in that divorce certification course. It was through the American Association of Christian Counselors. I didn't think I was doing it for anyone but me, but I just thought, wow, let me learn from the the experts who really Mm -hmm. know these top psychologists and counselors. And I learned a lot in that process. You know, for example, the person who leaves on average has been thinking about it for at least two years. So that person has a two year jump start. They've already thought about what they're going to tell their parents, what they're going to say at work, where they're going to live, the money where the other person who's really blindsided is starting at zero and almost negative because it's such a shocking setback. So a divorce coach, there are different niches in the divorce coach. What I do is I really help people with the emotional healing. So the identity, the forgiveness, the renewing of your mind, your purpose, loving yourself again, learning to live in gratitude, Because I, for 35 years, have been a clinical exercise physiologist, certified nutrition specialist, and lifestyle expert, I also include what I call divine health, because you can't separate the body, the mind, and the spirit. No, Um, no. I, I train on abundance because so many women especially get into poverty. In fact, it's the biggest age group for poverty is single moms in the country. In fact, if women don't get remarried, their chances of staying in poverty or getting there are really, really high. Um, And then how to create a life of joy, resurrection and celebration. So that's the niche in divorce coaching that I chose to take. Well, it's a very much needed uh, area for you to have a strength in and for for other people who have taken on this role and excel in this area because it's it's quite one. And and I've had cancer twice and it I would say divorce is right up there with hearing that uh, diagnosis is that devastating speaking personally. So, well, it's interesting uh, because the incidence of cancer in women post-divorce is really high, specifically right breast cancer or any of the the female organs post-divorce, the the right side represents the masculine. So it's a, you know, an attack and insecurity on the right side of the body. So that, that actually happens a lot, everything from, you know, migraines to gut issues to cancer. When you are assaulted emotionally like that, it's going to show up somehow physically, if you're not doing things to be as well as you possibly can. Right. It, it stress will, will do uh, stress from various sources, but that's an interesting statistic. And I like that you're stuff is all evidence-based. You always have great, great data and statistics to support, uh, you know, what you're saying and the the authenticity of it. So, you know, you mentioned something there I was going to get to later, but you talked about the loss of identity. Let's, let's explore that a little bit, because I think that's really, really important, particularly for, you know, homemakers who don't work for, or just 
the people who get blindsided so often that is our, our identity, just like a job might be for a guy, for women. A lot of times it's that relationship. How do you, you know, direct people to kind of cope with that? Who am I all of a sudden? If I'm not part of this couple, who am I? Well, divorce is a major life event for a reason, because everything in your life usually changes. You probably have to change where you live, which means maybe your kids' schools are changing. Your friend group is probably changing because they were all couples and now you're a single person and you're, you know, you're just not going to fit in with that group necessarily. And you might be going back to work or changing where you work because now you need a better job or you've got to manage daycare. So it's a, your identity with almost everything that you have lined up in the world may change. You may have to sell your fancy car and get a you know practical car or your identity is lined up in the designer shoes or purse or whatever. And all that may go away in a moment. And if your identity was built on anything in the earth, in the world, it could be stripped away, especially your identity as a wife. And if that's something you valued, that can be gone in a moment. The number one age for divorce is 30. The number two age for divorce is 50. Are so you serious? 50, yes. Number one is 30? Number one is 30. I know, but wow. the average age now that people are getting married is later and later and later. Right. So 30 years ago, it was 24. Now it's 28. So pe people are getting married later and less people are getting married. So they're living together. More people are getting prenuptial agreements. But by 30, now all of a sudden you've got two kids, you've got a mortgage, you've got two car payments, you've got, and that stress just rises up in them. And a lot of times one of the people will quit. Infidelity is definitely a, one of the biggest reasons for divorce. But at 50, what's also changing is now your kids are going off to college. Now you're an empty nester. They're leaving the house. So now your role as a mom is changed. So, so much identity is, is changing in a moment. You might go from a family of five to you within a year's time. So, and pets are split up even sometimes, like you lose your dog. I mean, it's just like, oh my goodness. And you're left with just you. So you really have to figure out who am I? And really a better question is whose am I? And for me, it was my faith that kept me going because yeah. I didn't ever, you know, shake my fist and say, you know, why did this happen to me? But it was more like, wow, who am I really? And if I'm the the biggest thing in my life, like if it's just my brain and my body and this is all there is, I'm in trouble. There better be something bigger than me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I'm a person of faith as well. For me also, I was glad that I believed in you know, God and not just the leader of the church. I went to a great church, had a good leader, but some things happened and had my faith been tied in that individual that would have impacted me as well. But I was able to go to another church because I believe that, you know, there was the God was God of all the churches and not just that one. But while wow, you just uh, bringing back a lot of thoughts and I have some friends going through a divorce right now, which I, I feel like I, I was also anxious to talk to you about this so that I could share with them this very positive uh, approach you have to divorce recovery, Kelly. So tell me about, so you, you become a certified divorce coach along with your other numerous certifications and I love knowledge. I'm an intellectual tourist as well. But tell me about being the chief evangelist at, it, at Intentionally Fabulous. Yes. So it was over two years ago that a friend of mine was in town and he was here kind of between two different places. So we had a few extra days. So we, I was so blessed to hang out with him and he mm -hmm. happens to be a branding expert. So I was ah. telling him about, you know, this concept, I want to launch this program. And so we sat down for two days and really hashed this out. And we came up with intentionally fabulous. He's like, Kelly, that, you know, you're so intentional in your life and you really have such a, a passion. You're such a great encourager for women to be fabulous. He goes, but you're not there yet. Oh. And I was like, I know you're right. He wow. goes, if you step on stage right now and try and tell people to be fabulous, he's like, you're, and I wasn't like I, even two years ago, I still hadn't fully forgiven you know, I still had some roots of bitterness. And so he could see it in me, but he knew that I wasn't quite there. So it became my intention to become personally fabulous so that I could lead other women. So I could show them what it looked like to be on the other side. So I launched a program under the Intentionally Fabulous brand called Single Redefined. And so that was my first program. And now I'm, I'm working on other programs 
But I, rather than, you know, chief executive officer, chief operating officer, or chief financial officer, I just love chief evangelist. And um, that is, you know, what I do. It's who I am. I encourage people and I spread good news and I give them hope. Absolutely. And it radiates from you. You you seem very happy in all our communication. You come across very positively. And when people aren't, aren't being genuine, when they're on, when they are not authentic, those of us who are emotionally intelligent or not, it comes through and, and how great to have a friend who or, you know, colleague who would be that honest with you as well. Uh, yes, he is a treasured friend. And really it takes three things. You, you do need to know your purpose. And at that point, that mm-hmm. was the thing that was lacking for me where, you know, I'd always done fitness, nutrition, wellness, lifestyle, and I felt like I was being called to something else, but I did not want to be the divorce coach. I was like, I'm sure my kids don't want me to be the divorce coach. I didn't even say the word divorce for a year. I hid it as long as I could. I didn't even tell my mom until after he oh. moved out. Oh. And I just felt like, I don't want this stage. I don't want this platform. So I was really resisting that purpose, but then mm-hmm. also um, the responsibility that that was going to hold. And I, I do want to be married again. I know I will be married again. I was thinking my future husband probably doesn't want his wife to be the divorce coach. And <laughs> so I, I really was resistant in that. And so finally, I, I really felt led and called to do it. So I was obedient to it. And then I really came to learn to love it. Understood. Understood. I, I resonate with you on that because I've become an advocate for cancer, and that certainly was never anything as a healthcare professional that I wanted to be a, a spokesperson for. But I just kept getting pulled into that arena, and I'm actually rather good at it. And but you know, if you Google me, that's one of the first things that comes up. So you know, before that first day, you pull it up. I don't even get to tell them. So I feel you on that. And uh, but you know, our future husbands are going to have to take us 360 as, as amazing as we are. And uh, we come with a past and a future. So Right. There it is. <laughs> so after your divorce, you've got an intentionally fat, fabulous. I'm, I'm recapping. And now you're ready to go out and help other women do this with your with your programs. And we'll tell pe- people how to reach out to you and put it in the show comments as well. But I know you're also a mindset pro. So I'd like to know what are two or three, not your whole program, but two or three top actions people going through divorce can take because it's a challenging time. What are, what are some concrete things they can do to kind of foster a positive mindset and get, get them on the in the right place for that? Yeah. One of the exercises that I do with them is a future-based exercise. So let's say today was April 15, 2022. I have them imagine it's April 15, 2023, and that we are best friends and we have not spoken in a year. And you can't wait for us to get to the coffee shop so you can tell me all about this past year. And so you talk about the year in past tense as if it's already happening. So you're telling me, you're like, Kelly, oh my goodness, finally found the man of my dreams. So in love. We got the house on the lake. My kids are thriving in school. Uh, I've been, you know, giving back to my favorite organization, you know, whatever it is, but you're speaking it as if it's already happening. And you do this every day for five minutes, either in the mirror or with an accountability partner or both. And when you both take 10 minutes to get on the phone every morning and you with this enthusiasm share about your future there's power to it because your thoughts is, you know, it starts with your belief, which becomes your thought, your thought becomes your words, the words become the actions, the actions become the habits, the habits become the character and the character becomes the identity. So if you start believing like, oh my goodness, a year from now, you know, I could be in doing the thing that I love. I could find the man of my dreams. My kids can be thriving you'll start to move towards it because there's energy and vibration and power to everything. So that's one of the things that I have them do. Um, Another thing with mindset is um, I'll have them really catch themselves saying the things that are not productive and write them down and then burn the list. So if they're, you know, retelling their story of how unjust it was or how unfair it was or, um, you know, just replaying that memory over and over because you, you create this emotion and it's not even how you remember it, but I'll have them write it down and then burn it and really start to 
get present by breathing, mm-hmm. and then replace that with a new and truthful thought. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. I'm going to borrow some of that. I'm going to tell you right now for, okay, <laughs> for future workshops. I love it. It absolutely does work. And I, I do believe that for lack of vision, a, a lot of people falter and perish. So you've got a really good approach. I can only imagine what the what the other strategies and tools are that you provide. Post-divorce, let's look at that again. After everything has finalized, you've healed and it, it takes time, which is why we caution people about quickly jumping into another relationship and getting somebody caught up in your, you know, your damage, your baggage or, you know, your process. When you do start thinking about everything and, and looking back to, you know, think about personal growth, what, what are some of the honest questions you should ask yourself about the relationship with the goal toward developing and, and becoming a better you? Yeah, one of the first things is thinking about your core values. So for example, I was 22 when I got engaged. Now I'm 52. <laughs> I am a different mm-hmm. person than I was 30 years ago. Right, right. And I have different, you know, values. Some are the same, but you know, some are different. So start to really write those down. And what I will do is when I meet people, not even just men, sometimes women, whether they're married, dating, single. I look for the good in people. So I'm like, wow, that guy really has a lot of wisdom or wow, this guy is really an adoring husband. This man, you know, he is really taking his health seriously. He is super fed. I love that about him. And I just start to make a note and even write things down of my non-negotiables. And so for me, you know, faith is a non-negotiable. I don't want to have to train a man up in faith. They need to be ahead of me there. I want my man leading me. I don't want to do that upside down again. Um, Health is important to me. It's my life. So for me to look at someone and go, well, he smokes. I could probably get him to quit. (laughs) No, (laughs) no, you can't change anything. Don't go into it thinking you could change a single thing. So one thing is to know your core values. And then second, I would say, start to open your heart to it because again, that's an energy that you put out there. So if you've been very close, like I have a lot of women who I work with that they, their hand is just up like, no, not dating. Don't need a man. Never again. Well, you are not going to attract a man when that's your energy. And it maybe isn't time. It could take two, three, four, six, seven years before you might Mm -hmm. feel ready. Everyone is different. But when you are ready, you need to shift that energy and start to open your heart and put that intention out there. Maybe you tell some friends who love you and know you and you trust them that you are starting to consider to get ready to, you know, have some introductions. Mm -hmm. If you know someone who, you know, faith, health, family man, whatever your things are, you know, please consider introducing us and just start to put that out there and and start there. I wouldn't say go on dating sites. That's not something I've done or have experience with, but wow, I've just seen people get sucked into the drama and distraction of, of all of that. And that works for some people. And I have friends who are dating coaches and there may be a way to do that, but I would say start with your core values and then start to open your heart and just put it out there that you're available. And then see who comes into your circle that might be interesting. Right. Who that positivity attracts. That's beautiful. And to bring your friends in because they, they know you sometimes in ways better than you know yourself and who might be uh, compatible with you. Um, Yeah, And and you might not have picked that person necessarily. You might not have been open, but because they made the introduction, you really value that. And you might meet a wonderful man. Maybe there's no love connection, but you both have room in your life for another, you know, faith-based Christian friend to go to a concert with or meet at the dog park, or it doesn't have to be romantic, but it's about community. It's about connection. And it's so lacking, especially when you go through divorce, isolation is a big deal. When I have people come into my uh, private free Facebook group, I ask them, what is your number one challenge? And loneliness is the number one answer. So even if you're not, you know, getting involved romantically, but there's somebody you can go to church with or go to brunch with, or there's nothing wrong with that. And you can be up front and say, you know what? I don't think there's a romantic connection here, but I would just like a buddy to hang out with and oh, yeah, you know, go on a hike yeah. with. Or a nothing plus one that. for certain events, you know, that, that 
depending on where you live, it can be very much, you know, a lot of events are oriented toward couples or a family, uh, I mean, a corporate meeting or whatever. So it's nice to have somebody that you already have a relationship and that a friendship, there's nothing wrong with friendship. That was something somebody had to tell me was just, you know, everybody is not a future husband. Just look at somebody for their, like you said, their good qualities and, and a potential friend and don't, you know, bring your angst into it and, and all the assessing. It's not a job interview. Just, yeah. you know, go have a good time. And it totally changed my dating life that I wasn't, you know, weatherproofing about everything. I was just, this is a nice person. I meet nice people all the time and we talk and have a good conversation and I don't make any more or less of it than that. So I yeah, you can relax when you know there's no, you know, romance pressure. coming. Like when they know, then you can, you'll probably go out more if you had a friend, like you would probably go to a concert mm -hmm. with a friend versus alone or a movie or even church. There's a lot of times now we can do everything online right now. So we don't right. even need to get up, and go to church. We just sit home. But if a friend was meeting me and then we were, you know, going to go to brunch or something, there's a better chance I'm going to go there and be present at church. If I have a friend versus me sitting alone. Absolutely. You're much more motivated if you're, you know, going to have a, companionship. You know, you mentioned something uh, about loneliness, and I've been reading a lot about how that is uh, has gotten even worse with the pandemic. Uh, hopefully we're coming out of it if we don't get another variant or whatever, but have you seen any data on how that's impacting the divorce rate? I, I would think maybe people were trying to stay with their partner, but uh, with, with everything that's going on in the world, but has it, has the divorce rate actually gone up or what have you seen? It's been interesting. So initially people were staying together because they thought, well, this is just going to be a couple of weeks. So you're going to hang in and hang in there. Couples who are strong, stayed mm -hmm. strong. Couples who already before had a weak foundation didn't make it. Mm -hmm. Couples who were not married as long, have a better chance of getting divorced because they had not been through anything hard yet. I mean, if you had been together 20, 30, 40 years, you've been through some stuff, you can make it through the pandemic. But if you hadn't been through anything hard, you hadn't spent this much time together, you hadn't been through a job loss or a sickness or homeschooling kids, or those were the marriages that really didn't make it. Prior to the pandemic, the divorce rate was 50% filed by a man, 50% by a woman. Since the pandemic, 78% of divorces are filed by women. Wow. Um, infidelity is the number one reason that they are giving. The prenuptial agreements have never been higher and less people are getting married. They're just living together. And the age is now 28. So everything was definitely affected uh, a lot. I think the women are asking for divorce more because they thought the man was going to come home and be helpful because mostly the women is primarily responsible for the, the house sure. you know, taking care and the caregiving. The second and the shift. And, yeah. <laughs> and they came home and didn't necessarily help. And then the women were like, you know, forget this. And, you know, that, that was not my story. Mine was all pre pandemic, but mm -hmm. I saw that happening where the women were like, no, now you're going to just be home and not help either. So um, you couldn't get away from each other. So if you used to stop on the way home from work and have a drink or whatever, now you're not doing that, or you're hiding the alcohol in your house, or they're seeing how much you drink, or, you know, you're in the basement on your computer all night. What are you doing? And so they, they missed out on hanging out with buddies. And so it, it did definitely come to a head for the couples who already, you know, had one foot out the door or right. didn't have good communication, whatever it was got escalated. That's, that's unfortunate, but also a, a lesson to us to, you know, be prepared in advance. We need to be working on our communication skills and, you know, working out mediating ways to share those responsibilities, because that's been a problem for a long time of women doing the majority of the housework and the, the child care, even with us moving into uh, corporate America. But I, I was just curious about that. That's that's thank you for sharing those sharing that data. And uh, hopefully those that are strong can continue to get stronger. And you, you mentioned homeschooling and which brings to mind uh, our kids. I have now adult sons. I mentioned earlier they were late teens when I got divorced. You have children. And we all know that divorce impacts not just our kids, but our, our entire family, our circle of friends. But 
for our for our kids is is really really difficult. There's so many things beyond their control, and the divorce does impact them, whether they're young or adults. Can you share some strategies as well to help our offspring? And you might have to do it by age, however you choose to share. But how to help them positively adapt to life with going through a divorce or with divorced parents? Yes. Well. Everyone has the need to be unconditionally loved. We all just want to be seen and loved for who we are. And children especially find security in their parents. That is the one thing that they think of all the world that their parents will stay together. So when the parents split, the kids are going to do something to try and feel loved. Um, Girls tend to isolate. Boys tend to get angry. Girls could tend to be the good girl, try and be a perfectionist and be perfect. Um, boys might, you know, act out or try and be the best at sports. The statistics for divorced kids are not good, meaning they have more dropout of school. There's more crime. There's more teen pregnancy. Their chances of being divorced are higher because the parents are divorced. So generationally, it just kicks off. If you were the first one could kick off, but it, it doesn't have to be. Obviously we can change all of those statistics. So Keep as much normal as possible for the kids. So if you can keep them in the same school district, if you can keep them in the same house, you know, similar neighborhood, same friend group, keep them in the sport they were in. Kids don't talk about this with other kids. We're not sitting at the lunch table at whatever age, you know, in school talking about my parents are getting divorced. So get them in a group. If there's a church group, if there's, you know, they can do counseling, they need some outlet. They need some place to share how they're feeling. And so if that's a possibility, getting them into counseling is definitely good. Stay connected to them. A lot of times the stronger parent will get the worst of them. So in my case, it was me and I got the anger, the rejection, the defensiveness, all of it. And and my kids were 16 and 17. So tough age anyway, you know, they they had their license or leaving the house, first boyfriend and girlfriend, first job. And, you know, we were all blindsided. So their worlds got blown up. And so um, know that if you're the stronger parent, you're probably going to get the worst of it. Do not put your kids in between for anything. Don't say, bring your dad his mail or, you know, tell your mom this. None of that communication. They do not want to be put in the middle. They do not want you to talk about their dad or mom, vice versa. So in front of them, don't have those adult conversations. Don't let them overhear But you also need to be real and raw. It's okay to let them know that, you know, mom's sad and mom's hurting. And um, I mean, there were times I ran into the closet and just cried because I didn't want my kids to see me. Um, So you're trying to protect their hearts while you're grieving yourself and going through, you know, attorneys and moving and, and all the things. So they need to see that you're being honest and real with them too. So keep the communication, keep the connection open. I would definitely wait until you started dating or at least bringing anyone home, you know, to your children, unless it was really, really serious, regardless of what age they are. And your kids want to see you be happy too. So they want to know mom's going to be okay. Dad's going to be okay. So do things that, you know, bring some joy in, have game night, do something fun, you know, let them pick something fun to do. Obviously don't try and buy their love. It's not about that. It's about time, quality time and connection and um, giving them a voice. Right. Oh, that's great. That's really good. You, yeah. Again, I'm, you know, having some flashbacks and that that's, you know, I took a course called divorce care, which they offer at churches throughout the country, perhaps globally. And that was a big help to me. But I, I know there were times when I'm in the car ran with my girlfriends and they're just sitting there and I wasn't really conscious. And I'd look over and see their faces, you know, and it's like, oh my goodness, I need, let me, let me get my tone right. Let me change the topic of conversation. Cause you're just so, you know, emotional and, and passionate, even if you're not talking to directly, directly to them. But one of the things that I realized was because mine were in high school, we were having, you know, the programs and they were athletes and where we had gone from mom and dad sitting at the same table, then we were, you know, opposite sides of whatever room we were in. And I remember my youngest 
getting an award. And then he looked from his dad's table to my table and the pain on his face just broke my heart that he felt like he had to choose because he'd been sitting with the team. And I called, you know, immediately after that, I called his dad. I was like, look, no matter what, let's at these programs, at their games or whatever, let's just sit together and work this out. I don't ever want to see that look again. I don't want him to feel like I got to choose between parents. And it was just a small little thing. It, I didn't wasn't crazy about it, but I was willing to do that for my kids. And it was just the whole tenor of those events changed because that was, you know, one less exercise and angst that they had to go through. So they're loving our children, even though we're going through a tough time. We had we, you know, we can make some sacrifices and compromises to just make it better for everybody. Uh, so while I am, I could have used you. <laughs> so, some years ago, let me just say that. And I know that the, the women you're working with are, are benefiting tremendously from this because, like I said, in, in divorce care, some of the things I learned kept me from doing things that I was inclined to do emotionally, tearing up pictures and silly stuff that you, you know, petty stuff that I'm so glad I didn't do. Any, um, you have a phrase that I've heard you use called being single on purpose. I love that. Explain that to me. Yeah. You know, it's like, what is great about this season? And a lot of times we start asking ourselves bad questions. Like, how did this happen to me? How did I get here? <laughs> but if you change it and you're like, okay, what, what's good about this? And there are good things about being single. You're like, wait a minute. I get to pick everything, like yes. the temperature of the house, what food I eat, when I go to bed, when I exercise, if that, how I decorate. I mean, everything. So you're like, that's pretty cool. That's pretty amazing. And I could be in the best shape of my life right now. Like there is no reason why I can't be my best self, you know, personal development wise, bringing healthy food in the house. I'm not bringing junk food in the house for anyone but me. So if I'm not eating healthy, it's, you know, completely up to me. <laughs> um, and you just start going down the list. You're like, wow, this is, this is really good because I can, playing girl trips. And I can just be so intentional about all the things that I have wanted to do that I have not been doing. So just keep asking yourself, what is great about this? And it sounds horrible. Like I'm divorced. What, what could possibly be great? But when you start to think about it, you're like, well, I could, you know, read books. I can, you have the time now that maybe you didn't have before. And maybe your house was, you know, fighting and anger and just tension before. And now you're like, wow, so peaceful. I'm going to put out my lavender candles. I'm going to take a bath. And so ask yourself, what's really great about this? And it's just a better question to ask. And you'll start to find things. Your brain will line up with, how can I be single on purpose? How can I be intentional that I have an opportunity to have a whole new bonus life that I get to start really from scratch and I can choose. Do I want to learn a language, take up art, get a pet. I mean, you can do anything now. Anything at all with your bonus life. I love that. That is beautiful. And that that is absolutely the right attitude to have, whether you're widowed, divorced, never married, is that, you know, live with intention and enjoy every moment, you know, no regrets. How can we make the best of this day, this moment, this time? I am absolutely on board with that. I, I, I do have one more question. It seems that you just work with women. I am certain when, I mean, with all the national exposure you've had, when, when men hear about this, that they're probably interested in your services too. What Do you actually limit yourself to women? Oh my goodness, why? this has been really surprising to me. So when I started putting things out there, whether it's, you know, a poll on LinkedIn or a post on Facebook, I cannot believe how many men respond. And they're like, what do you have for men? Can you help me? Do you work with men? I have nothing against men and I do not think they suffer any less. I know they suffer just as much, but at the time that I went through my divorce, I had eight friends who were getting divorced at the same time. And I was just watching, you know, what was happening to the women. So my heart was really for the women and I mostly, you know, only get their side of the story. I don't, hadn't spoken to the men as much. Um, but I just felt led to do that, but I am working with men now. So okay, good <laughs> the to know. program I'm that I created is for women, but I'm working one-on-one -on -one with men. And I've been encouraged by many, many male friends to work with men and create a program for men 
Um, but I, I can't put them in my female group. I need to start, you know, a new group or a new program, but I, I am working one-on-one with men. I, I, I like that. I think that's good. That in that course that I referenced earlier, there were a lot of men. And I, when I saw the depth of their heartbreak and the crying and the some of the stories they were telling, because I grew up with a bunch of kind of alpha caveman type males. So that just totally caught me off guard. I was like, oh, my goodness, they are just as hurt as, as we are. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it was eye opening, too. I, I needed to know that. And uh, so I'm I'm glad any final tips. Tell us about your program, what you're doing next. Just, I'm excited. I'm team Kelly. Uh, awesome. Well, yeah, I would love for anyone going through a separation, divorce, post-divorce who is willing, even if you don't feel like, you know, I can do it all. If you just have a desire to be well, to leave the, you know, rejection, grief, aside and get ready to start healing, join the free Facebook page. It's called Intentionally Fabulous. We talk about the hard things. We laugh. We support each other. You need community. So please come join that free community and participate. Don't just be a fly on the wall, but really engage in the Intentionally Fabulous community. The program, oh my goodness, it will help you to get rid of the grief to help you if you've had sexual trauma, if you've had infidelity, if you you have brain fog, if you literally you know have physical illness from holding your breath to migraines to can't focus, whatever you're feeling, you will find the answers in this program. I have over 21 interviews in there with the top experts that I hired. So it's my grief counselor, my divorce recovery coach, my breath therapist, my meditation therapist, and. And so you get to be a fly on the wall to all those interviews and hear their top tips on how to heal. And then you get the eight weeks and there's a full healing guide also. So the healing guide helps you to fully overcome, get empowered, learn to celebrate life and um, really to, to move on. Awesome. I will drop uh, the links to your Facebook group and your website in the show notes. And it's, I believe it's kellycalabrese.com or is it .org? Uh, Or intentionallyfabulous.com is where they can go straight to the program. If they want to get a free copy of my latest best-selling book, they can go to kellycalabrese.com. It's called Success Habits of Super Achievers. And it tells the stories of over 80 ordinary people who had something unreasonably difficult happen to them And they chose to get back up and be resilient and overcome and not only just get better, but to do something really amazing with their lives and to help other people. So they can get a free e-copy there. It's an Amazon bestseller at kellycalabrese.com. Yay, freebies. You heard it right here. Yes. (laughs) Kelly, you have been awesome. I, I have no doubt your book is a bestseller that everything you touch turns to gold because you are amazingly inspiring and you have taken a a very dark difficult time and made it a bright shining light and beacon of hope for so many people continued success to you with your mission to help others going through separation degree grief and various various other life transitions I really really respect and appreciate what you're doing thank you Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Mo, for having me for this show. I mean, the, the world really needs this kind of content. So thank you. And wasn't that a great program? Oh, love that episode. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. Learn more about me on my website, drmoanderson.com. That's M-O-E. You can read book excerpts, watch videos, learn about my services that I offer, and book me for a speaking engagement. I'd love to talk with your group, and I'd love to work with you. So until the next time, review, renew, and re-you. Thank you.